I'll start the story with the four-masted auxiliary motor schooner Astoria pictured here. On board, 380 lineal kilometres of timber for the Globe Timber Merchants in Port Perry, South Australia. She steamed from Portland, Oregon on the west coast of Northern America to Sydney via Hawaii. World War I had been raging for some two years, however America had only declared war on Germany in April a couple of months earlier. It's now June 1917. Maybe the crew had thoughts about the war as they proceeded on the long ocean journey. The Astoria, commissioned late 1916, was quite an advanced ship so far as Australian shipping goes. She had two diesel engines, this is 1916, wireless radio and electric winches. The four masts and sails were for auxiliary propulsion. She was quite a lazy sailing vessel. The Astoria arrived in Sydney. From there she planned to sail around the south coast and into South Australia. However, on leaving Sydney she reached the vicinity of Gabo Island on the southeast coast and struck engine difficulties. The crew finally set the sails, it takes about an hour to do so, and made her way back to Sydney. On investigation they found the engines needed parts that were not able to be sourced from foundries in Australia. They decided to order the engine parts from the US. After some deliberation it was decided that they would tow the Astoria with all its timber cargo to Port Pirie. They engaged Hutt at Parker Limited, a shipping company with head office in the Port of Melbourne. Hutt at Parker was well established with agencies in the eastern and southern states including Hobart. Among their fleet was an ocean going steam tug called Niora. The Niora was an extremely powerful vessel with a 1300 horsepower triple expansion steam engine twin boilers and considerable speed, capable of reaching up to 13 knots. She was over 40 metres long, some 6.5 metres in breadth. A picture of the Niora alongside the five-masted American schooner Snow and Burgess. And here she is carrying out her duties in World War I, towing His Majesty's Australian hospital ship Kanauna. Kanauna sailed to England as a troop ship and was converted in England to a hospital ship to bring back 452 wounded soldiers. In 1929, Kanauna came to grief off Wilson's Promontory in Bass Strait and now lies in over 70 metres of water. Niora steamed from Melbourne to Sydney to take the Astoria in tow. To assist in fueling the steam tug for the long journey from Sydney to Port Perry, some 30 to 40 tonne of coal was loaded onto the Astoria and an extra 4 tonne of coal onto the stern deck of the Niora. The coal was planned to be transshipped from the Astoria to the Niora en route. As they made their way down the east coast, they were pushing through gale conditions and poor sea state. As they steamed on, conditions were poor and other vessels were seeking more sheltered waters. Captain deciding that they will take shelter in Port of Melbourne or Queenscliff. They laid over for four days. It is likely that the coal was transshipped from the Astoria during this time. They commenced their journey onwards, pushing through heavy seas, steaming off the southeast coast of South Australia, up through Backstairs Passage, Investigator Strait, and onto Port Perry in the Upper Spencer Gulf. Port Perry was a bustling industrial town in 1917, quite a contrast to other industrial cities such as Broken Hill, which saw a downturn. The Astoria's 380 km of timber was to be primarily consumed for the expansion of the BHB Port Piri smelters seen here circa 1919. As the Port Piri paper, the recorder notes, whilst in Port Piri on July the 4th, which is America's celebration of Independence Day, a bystander noted, and in calling out loud so all could hear, we have donned our hats to you. Your stars and stripes fly alongside our jack, which is the Australian flag, and as allies we stand for liberty and freedom. The Astoria's cargo of timber was unloaded, the Niora had bunkered coal, and the local harvest control was advised by their supervisors that the Niora can take on an extra 40 tonne of coal rather than load the bulk of the extra coal onto the Astoria. It was secured on the stern deck. On the 7th of July, the Niora departed for Sydney with the Astoria in tow. Sailing through Backstairs Passage, they hit heavy seas once again, and on clearing Kangaroo Island, conditions worsened and they hove to. Later, they picked up about half speed, heading southeast. At 7 a.m. on the 9th of July, the steamship Southborough heading for Port Perry sighted the Niora in the distance. 
At around this time the Southborough was taking damage from the seas and wind. Large bow bullet plates were smashed in, frames were damaged and the tarp to number one hold was lost to the winds. At 7.20am the Southborough passes the Nyora and Astoria, noting how well Nyora is faring given the conditions. By this time the coal on the deck of the Nyora is down to about 14 tonne. As coal from the stokehold is fed, the crew lighten the stern load by moving the excess down into the stokehold. At 9am the steamship Southborough still had the Astoria in sight. Not soon after, however, the steam tug Nyora encounters difficulties. She takes on the list as a result of the remaining coal on the deck shifting. The heavy seas coming over the high bulwarks of the tug cannot easily escape through the scuppers. Now in great difficulty, the crew of the Nyora slip the line to the Astoria in an effort to save themselves. They take a southwest and southeast course to endeavour to right themselves. At approximately 10.30am on the 9th of July, the 2 inch thick teak engine room door is smashed in by the seas and the order is given to cut the two lifeboats free. One was not able to be got. The Astoria now helpless some miles away could do nothing but watch the disaster unfold. An able seaman Gordon Lansley, who was at the helm of the Nyora along with the captain William McBain were thrown from the open bridge into the sea. All other crew had already been called to the deck to ensure that they could do the best to save themselves. Lansley had surfaced seeing coal and other debris floating around and nearby was an upturned lifeboat with the engineer sitting on top. He made reach for it and climbed up. Some 100 yards away, the captain was swimming towards the boat. All three managed to turn the boat over to find that the stem had been pulled out of it. They managed to grab a nearby fireman who was wearing a life belt and they remained with the boat. The 12 other crew were reported to have been dragged down with the Nyora. The Nyora sank quickly. With the four stranded on the boat and with approximately an hour passing, the captain noted that the Astoria would be helpless as he could see her underbelly in the distance and they could see the smoke of a steamer passing by. It was the SS Tarkula making its way north for Port Piri. The Astoria endeavoured to race the Tarkula by wireless radio. However, the Tarkula was not fitted with wireless. The Tarkula could see in the distance the Astoria, with her sails now set. However, did not realise it was actually under the tow of Nyora. The Tarkula continued north. Not soon after, the engineer and the fireman would die, some hour apart from each other. They slipped away into the sea. Lansley and Captain McBain struggled with the boat, pulling a plank to help row and steer. They headed for the coast, some 50 kilometres away. The Astoria made its way to Geechan Bay, arriving approximately 4.30pm. It reached the Navy by wireless and relayed the events. By 7.30pm that night, Lansley and McBain could see in the distance the light emitting from Margaret Brock Reef Lighthouse and through the stormy seas they made their way. By the next day at approximately 8.30am they reached the outer reef. The lightkeepers aware of the disaster that unfolded spotted them and tried to warn them away from the treacherous reef. The survivors were too exhausted and senior lightkeeper Jameson and assistant Clark, at great risk to their own lives, rode a dinghy out to them through the rolling breakers pulling the survivors in and getting them back to the lighthouse. The lightkeepers were subsequently awarded bravery medals. The City of Adelaide lifeboat stationed out of Robe was requested to attend the disaster area, however reported that they had engine difficulties and could not put to sea until the following day. The Hutter and Parker steamship Yarra was dispatched from Port Adelaide to search the disaster area and also to locate the Astoria and take her in tow back to Port Adelaide. The only item recovered from the area was a fire bucket, and the picture of this is in the archives. Hutter and Parker had another vessel in Port Adelaide, the steamship Corio, and she was commissioned to tow the Astoria back to Sydney. When arriving in the vicinity of Gabo Island, the tow line was lost. The Corio could not relocate the Astoria, and so once again the Astoria set her sails, arriving back in Sydney before the Corio. The Astoria was finally repaired, however before returning home had already been sold to other US interests. The company that owned the Astoria had laid a new keel for a vessel, which they also called the Astoria. The Astoria and crew arrived back in Portland, Oregon in November 1917, some six months after they first left. 
The inquiry findings into the disaster did not attribute blame to any single person, putting cause to coal shifting on the stern deck. However, outside the inquiry it was challenged as to why the Nyora was allowed to set sail with 40 tonne on the stern deck, when in Sydney the Harbour Authority would not allow any more than 4 tonne on the deck. The Nyora's plimsoll line was breached, reducing freeboard, and should have not been allowed to set sail from Port Piri. The Astoria only tried to raise the SS Tarkula by radio and not also with flares or detonators. If the latter had been used, the captain of the Tarkula was of the view that he would have noticed and possibly done something to assist. A memorial for seafarers and lightkeepers that have lost their lives in the area is erected at Cape Jaffa. The crew of the Nyora who lost their lives are remembered. <laughs>